All right, take out your Bible. We'll go to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, we're up to verse number 36. Paul is concluding his portion of the letter to the Corinthians. This portion is dealing with the use of spiritual gifts in the gathering of the church when they've gathered for worship. And in these last few verses, we've just got 36 through 40 tonight. He gives admonition to the Corinthians regarding, I'll call it their posture. So certainly we are working toward verse 40, which says, let all things be done decently and in order, which aligns well with the first two points we've made in this section, kind of main points. You can agree or disagree on tongues or prophecy or women's role in the church. But in the end, come to these three conclusions. Verse 26, let all things be done unto edifying. Verse number 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. And then verse number 40, do all things decently and in order. If ever your views on the Holy Spirit's gifts do not lend to those three things, you can be sure you're mistaken in your views on the use of the Holy Spirit's gifting to the church. Because the Holy Spirit will not bring confusion. He will bring peace to the church. He will not bring division. He will bring unity to the church. So let's read together. We'll start in verse 26 and read through verse 40. How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three, and that by course. Let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. Let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace. For ye may all prophesy one by one that all may learn and all may be comforted. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as in all, the, as in all churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Okay, let's pray. God, we're glad to have your word. We're glad to have time together with the church around your word. We ask for your blessing upon this time. May your Holy Spirit illuminate our minds as we consider your word tonight. We want to grow. We want to become more like Christ. Sanctify us with your word. Thank you that your word is truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul addresses their posture here. We begin with just what he says there in verse 36. He, he asks some rhetorical questions. He asks what we might say of a teenager, some smart alecky questions. He says, what? Did the word of God come from the Corinthian church? Are you the only ones who know about these things? Why is he asking these rhetorical questions? As he finishes addressing speaking in tongues, the woman's role in the ministry, the, the, the role of the prophet in the gatherings here, he, he, he sort of admonishes, well not sort of, he admonishes the Corinthian church because of their posture in regards to these things. Remember we first started our study in the letter to the Corinthians, we talked about this town and we talked about this church and how, boy, it was just really a church on fire for God. It was a church that the, the Holy Spirit was evident in because they exercised and practiced all of these things. And it was, it was spectacular. But Paul had to kind of write to them and say, you sort of need to calm down a little, which is unique, right? I mean, that's a, he's sort of being the wet blanket here. 
But in this, he, he brings that full circle and addresses this posture. And it's not for the sake of trying to put a damper on the work of the Holy Spirit, which we should never do. Quench not the Spirit. It's for the sake of not being built up in our pride because of how we suppose the Spirit to be gifting us. And he gives the ultimate question of posture here. What do you think? All this starts with you? You know the old joke, I met a guy who wrote the book on humility. He was very proud of that book. This is sort of Paul's posture. He addresses them here. He seems to anticipate the Corinthians responding with some opposition to his admonition. Came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. John MacArthur said here, Paul knew that the Corinthians would react to all these firm regulations that would end the free-for-all in their services. The prophets, tongues, speakers, and women may all have been resistant to words. So he anticipated that resistance by sarcastically challenging those who put themselves above his word and thus above scripture by either ignoring it or interpreting it to fit their predisposed ideas. That's well said. We often will do the same with the word and the thing we must remember and tell ourselves is this is God's full truth and this is absolute truth. Written is done. What the Bible says is how the church must operate. If we ever begin to only accept parts of it and leave other parts out, well, then we've undermined our own authority as the church, and we have none. We must stand firmly on what the Scripture says, even at times where it might become a cultural embarrassment to us, even at times where it may be uncomfortable to us within the culture. If we undermine the very foundation. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? Nothing at all. So to meet any of these arguments, Paul uses irony here in verse number 36, asking, did the word of God come originally from you? Was it only you that the word of God reached? If the Corinthians profess to know more about these matters than Paul the apostle, he would ask them if they as a church Produce the word of God. Now you, you get the rhetoric there. In this scenario, who was it who had produced the word of God? It was Paul the apostle. So to go ahead and pre-answer their possible objections to the things he's writing to them about here. He's reminding them that, hey, and Paul has been humble in this all along. He's not, he's not being prideful here. But he's reminding them here, as the apostle, the New Testament prophet, the new covenant one to give the word. He is giving them absolute truth. It's a, it's a like it or lump it. If you can't say amen, say oh me, right? Don't shoot the messenger. Just be aware of the message. It's one of these scenarios. Their attitude here kind of seems like they're setting themselves up as an official authority on these matters. You can imagine what that would be like in our time. They would be saying, oh, well, well, we're the church who does this. These other churches, they don't know. They don't understand. Maybe even Paul, he doesn't quite get it because he's not here. But boy, we really got things going on here, right? And that's, that's the attitude. McDonald, William McDonald, in the Believer's Bible Commentary wrote this. He said, the facts are that no church originated the word of God and no church has exclusive rights to it. Paul's point being that the Christians or the, the Corinthians, the Christians in Corinth, not claim such authority since the gospel of Jesus Christ did not originate with them. Instead, the gospel has been passed along to them by the apostles. Should they reject Paul's writings, then they are in effect acting as if they were the source of the scriptures or that they had an additional source of the scriptures. And both of those would be an error. So Paul asks, did the word of God come out from you? Or did the word of God come to you only? This, this type of response that Paul is presupposing that they would have is it's sort of a, a claim of original authority that's not good. It reflects arrogance. It reflects pride. Do they think they can invent their own rules? 
Do they think they can practice that in contrast to what has been prescribed at all the other churches? Practice? Look with me at verse 33 here. For God is not the author of what? Confusion. But he is the author of peace. And then notice the end of that verse. As in all churches of the saints. The, all of the churches of the saints. God has authored peace and not confusion. Well, for there to be peace and not confusion, then there has to be a standard. There has to be a, a set way. And this is what Paul is talking about here. God's word hasn't come to the Corinthians alone. All the churches share the same message. All the churches should be sharing the same practices based off of this same message. Now, please don't over apply that in our day. You, you can take this too far. Mission boards have done this for years. They will presuppose on American missionaries in foreign lands that they've got to go and only do church the way that we do it in America when the culture is different in these foreign lands. This is not the point. These are not proof texts for that. But when any church gathers together, Paul is giving clear instruction here on what speaking in tongues should look like, what giving a prophecy should look like, etc. Now that can apply across cultures. There's a biblical standard that is unmatched by any culture. In fact, it, it works in today's culture or yesterday's culture or tomorrow's culture. Flip back to chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse number 17. He wrote there and said, For this cause have I sent unto you Timothy, who is my beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. So what is Paul saying there? It's Timothy's coming to you with a letter, and it's the same thing that I would say anywhere to any church. Now, when we first went through that in chapter 4, it didn't carry this same kind of importance. But now we look back on this from chapter number 14, and Paul has said some we, we, we spent a lot of time last week. We were in church for two hours. I've been told I can't take that long tonight. But we were here a long time last week dealing with the verses because they were counter to our culture and, and a little bit hard for us. But Paul is clear here. Chapter 14, verse 33. God is not the author of confusion, but is peace as in all the churches of the saints. And he's already said, Timothy is coming to you with a letter. It's the same thing that I say to all the churches in all the places. Look at chapter 11, verse number 16. But if any man seem to be contentious, we have no such custom, neither the churches of God. What is he saying there again? It's the same way in all the churches. If it's a true church, it operates according to the prescribed things in the scriptures. Now, does that mean that every church, every Sunday morning, sings the doxology after they receive the offering? Well, if they're right with God, they do, right? <laughs> no, of course not. I love the old, you know, the church was planning to make some changes to things. They wanted to freshen it up and reach the new generation. Somebody had the idea of, well, we shouldn't have church at... 11 a.m. anymore. You should have it at some other time, you know. And the old codger stood up in church and said, well, bless God. If it was good enough for Peter and Paul and James to go to church at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings, it's good enough for us. <laughs> we can get stuck in our traditions at times. These are not what we're talking about here. We're talking about biblical authority on particular things. Tom Schreiner said the Corinthians must not deviate from what is done in the other churches. For such a stance reflects partisan pride and a divisive spirit. We've got to consider this in the church now. I wonder, church, are we guilty of seeking new revelations that go beyond the Word of God? We have the Word of God. We have the authority of the Word of God. Are we content with that or do we seek more? Are we operating as if the Word of God originated with us? We're the final authority. No, the word is the final authority. Warren Mearsby gives helpful commentary here when he writes, 
He says, in these verses, Paul was answering the church member who might say, we don't need Paul's help. Can you imagine? I'm going to finish the, the Wearsby quote in just a moment, but I can just see that at, even at our church sometimes. If we were in the day and age of Paul the Apostle, but we've had our board meeting and we're calling a congregational vote and somebody says, well, we got a letter from Paul that says, and we, well, hang on a minute now. Isn't he in jail somewhere? We, we don't need to hear from this guy. And sadly, we, we laugh at that because we like Paul and we like his doctrine and we like his teachings, but there are modern day Christians who said, we're not going to take all of the Bible. We're going to cast out the writings of Paul and we're just going to be red letter Christians. We're just going to take the writings of Jesus. This is awfully problematic. Paul continued in the doctrines that Jesus began teaching. But some would say, oh, Jesus was never quite as harsh. But you would be misunderstanding Jesus to take that approach. To go on continuing with Wearsby here. We don't need Paul's help. The Spirit speaks to us. We have received new and wonderful revelations from God. This is a dangerous attitude. Because it is the first step toward rejecting God's word and accepting counterfeit revelations, including the doctrines of demons. That's Wearsby's quote. How did Jesus tell the woman at the well that God, who is a spirit, must be worshipped? Spirit and in truth. Often there's just truth, so you have dead orthodoxy. You need to be led of the spirit. Often there's so much emphasis on the spirit that you leave off truth and there's no orthodoxy you need to be full of holding forth the word of god and then when we get into this whole well we have the holy spirit don't we we do we're indwelled by the holy spirit so we have god with us paul paul wrote and said if you're not careful you'll be susceptible to the doctrines of other spirits demonic spirits because you're trying to rely upon the Holy Spirit outside of the written word. So to get the spirit, you've got to get the word. Let me give you a proof text for that. 1 Timothy 4.1. If you want to turn there. 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the spirit speaketh expressly. Holy Spirit, capital S. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, you had no trouble tonight with someone saying that there will be people in the latter times who give themselves over to counterfeit revelations and the doctrines of demons. Because you probably know someone who's given themselves over to something demonic or satanic. What we struggle with, especially in a Baptist church like ours, is that he says here, some shall depart from the faith. What does he mean there? He's saying here some that were in the faith, regenerate members of the church, begin to be influenced by demons, by spirits. How do they fall prey to this? Did they get a Ouija board? Did they start getting their cards read? No. They left off the study of God's word and tried to give themselves over to just being led of the spirit. You can't be led of the spirit outside of the word. Back in 1 Corinthians 14, we have verse 37 and 38. 37 says, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. He says, Some may consider themselves prophets. Some may consider themselves to be spiritual. As people of the Spirit and as prophets, they would be speaking the word of the Lord. And thus, they may think that they do not need instruction from Paul on these matters. Well, Paul reminds them here that any tempted to think this way, his words. Look at verse 37 here. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. Those who begin to think Paul, we don't need Paul need to remember that the things that Paul are writing to them are the commandments of the Lord. These things are the words of the Lord. And then he says in verse 38, the failure to heed these writings from Paul 
carries consequences. This is very helpful to us in our day. It's so easy to pick and choose in the scriptures. It's why we believe as a church that the preacher should preach verse by verse through the Bible. You guys don't need me picking and choosing what we preach and what we don't. Because when we have a low offering one Sunday, guess what I'm preaching on the next Sunday? Money. Giving. Good stewardship. And then when I feel like y'all been sinning a little too much, I'm going to preach on hell. No, we just preach the full account of the word and what it says. And we let the Holy Spirit through the word speak to you and, and work on you and lead you. And it's an amazing thing. How many of you in here have been saved more than 30 years? You've been a member of the church, active in your faith for more than 30 years. All right. How many of you in that 15 to 30 year window? You're not been th- you haven't reached 30 yet, but you're 15. How many 15 or under? We have believers here of all ages. We have babies. We have teenagers. I don't mean your physical, natural birth age. I mean your how long you've been saved. And we've even got some saints, some old... I don't know the right word. Some of you have been saved a long time. That's what I'm trying to say. Hopefully mature in the faith, right? How in the world should any one preacher be able to come up and take a text and preach on a way that is helpful to the baby, but also feeds the mature? You ever tried that with humans? You're mature as an adult. What do you want for dinner tonight? Well, I'll take a steak. You know, we have a baby in the house. What does the man say? Blend it up. (laughs) Doesn't work this way, does it? You have to give the baby milk. Okay, well, what does the man want? He doesn't want milk. He wants meat. How does this work? It works through the word of God that is alive and quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. It works through the power of the Holy Spirit who illuminates the word as we give it forth. I'm a herald. I'm a messenger, an ambassador of the king, just simply bringing you the king's message. And then the the king himself works it over in our lives and makes it fit. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So he says here, if you are ignorant, let him be ignorant. There's consequences to failing to heed the word of God. In this specific context, he's saying failing to heed Paul's words and answering the objection of, we don't need Paul, we have the Holy Spirit. Very problematic because it's not just Paul. It's God through Paul. McDonald says, if, if a person refuses to acknowledge the inspiration of these writings and to bow to them obediently, then there is no alternative but for him to continue in his ignorance. So Paul is saying here, those who ignore what Paul writes will be ignored by God. Now, we need to clarify here, that verse 38 does not suggest that Paul wanted people to remain ignorant. That's not what he's saying. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. He's not saying that we should remain ignorant on any doctrine of the Bible. He is simply saying that should we fail to heed the word of God, we should expect to remain ignorant. If if Paul wanted people to remain ignorant, why would he have written this letter? Certainly that's not the case. He concludes this discussion in verse 39 and 40. First, in verse number 39, he says that believers should be eager to prophesy. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. We should be eager to prophesy. The the verb that he uses here is the same that he's used in other portions of this book to, to say to believers, that they should eagerly desire the greater gifts or that they should eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit. And here he uses that word again here and says that they should covet, that they should eagerly desire to prophesy. That's in chapter 12. If you want to look there, chapter 12, verse 31. But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I show you a more excellent way. And then in chapter 14, verse 1, He says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. Now he's concluding this section and he says it again. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy, forbid not to speak with tongues. So this entire discussion 
has led to the conclusion that they should especially desire to prophesy because prophecy edifies the church. That's one of those key principles that we have in this section from verse number 30, 26. Let all things be done unto edifying. Much of chapter 14 has been devoted to this, this superiority of prophecy over the gift of tongues. Tom Schreiner says, still one could lurch in the other direction and repress tongues altogether. Thus the believers are told not to forbid, forbid tongue speaking. He says that clearly, doesn't he? And forbid not to speak with tongues. And then in verse number 40, acknowledging that speaking in tongues is a legitimate gift of the Spirit, he says, let all things be done decently and in order. So he, he, he adds this final comment here. Tongues, prophecy, any other gift must be exercised in a fitting and an orderly way. But if you haven't been here for us with this, we, he's laid out clear exactly what that orderly way looks like. Who should, who shouldn't, when they should, when they shouldn't, and all of these things. And then we would hold to tongues being the Greek word glossa. That's how it's used in the scriptures, meaning a physical language, a human language language it's it's not even some would say well he said the tongues of men and angels but if you you never find angels speaking anything in scripture except the language of the people they're speaking to so that's that's the tongues of angels right so the rules that have already been set forth must earlier be heeded no languages without an interpretation so you can't just take off in here tonight speaking in spanish Unless there's someone who can understand your Spanish and interpret it to us rednecks who don't speak Spanish. Right? Uh, the second rule, people must prophesy and speak in tongues one at a time. So there should never be this confusion of multiple people speaking in tongues at the same time. I think that's a good rule for lots of things. Well, we, would we sing two different songs at the same time? be kind of odd, wouldn't it? But we sing the same song at the same time together in unison, and that's all right. When the foundational work of the apostles and the prophets ended, we would say that the gifts of knowledge, prophecy, tongues would no longer be needed. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 8, it says, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. What is he saying there? He said, these things were here for a time, but when that time passes, they will no longer be needed, so they will no longer be used. But at the same time, we would understand that God can do whatever he wants to do. So God could give the gifts today if he pleased and if it was needed. And the understanding that we had there early on in our study was that we would sure hope that anyone in the world today could get access to the Bible in their own language, but should they not be able to, and the only way God could get them a copy of the Bible is for someone to be able to miraculously speak in their tongue and give the scriptures, then God could bless the hearing or the speaking and allow that to happen. We, we serve a miracle-working God. But should a, a church full of all English-speaking people need the gift of tongues? Of course not. There might be gifts that we do need that are not specifically listed in the scriptures. Is the Holy Spirit able to give those gifts? He absolutely is. And so this is Paul's thinking. But with all of this, the rule is there in verse number 40. Let these things be done decently. And let them be done in order. So prophecy continues in the end here to be preferred over tongues because it strengthens the people's faith. It can even lead to faith, meaning the giving of the word, prophecy, giving of the word of God. So the speaking in tongues would be the miraculous giving of the word of God. But once the word of God has been given, then the prophecy becomes the thing to be sought after. Why? Because it's edifying. Edification and the strengthening of believers were closely tied together. It's easy to get into these passages that deal with the spiritual gifts and miss the point. He wasn't writing to them about whether these things are real or not. He wrote to them as real because they were real in their churches. He wrote to them and said to them, you're, you're missing the point. It's great that you guys can exercise the spiritual gift of tongue speaking, 
but are you edifying one another? And he said to the Corinthians, you're not edifying one another with these things. You're almost showing off and elevating yourselves above one another with these things. So what should you do? Verse 26, let all things be done unto edifying. How should we know if the things that are being done are of God or are not? Verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So how should we do it? Verse 40, do all things decently and in order. The Spirit's gifts are not to be used willy-nilly whenever people feel they are being guided by the Spirit. The gifts were not for self-expression. The gifts were to build up other believers in the faith. R.C. Sproul said, the decency and orderliness of the church's worship furthers the aim of mutual edification and displays that our God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Let me end with a quote from Chuck Swindoll. He says, a worship service should be a beautiful, meaningful, and edifying experience for all. It should be open to the appropriate contributions of all. Under the oversight of properly ordained leadership, And all of this without a trace of disorder, chaos, or confusion. Most of all, all things must be done with one goal in mind. The mutual edification of the body of Christ. That's good. Now, I'll just give you some chance commentary here. I don't think that Paul is teaching or that most of the guys that I quoted from tonight, a couple of them would disagree with me, but most of them would not mean that that says that we have to have a specific liturgy, order of service, that we stick to every single time we meet and that we never veer off of that. In fact, I think that can often be problematic because we're sticking more to man's ways and not leaving ourselves open to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But for the most part, we should be able to trust the Holy Spirit ahead of time to plan what we're going to do during our worship service and then decently and in order do what he has led us to plan. But with that... When our hearts are tender to his leading and when we're doing what we feel like he's had us plan out to do, there can come times where he leads something else that's not part of the plan. And there'll be a unique thing that'll happen if that ever happens in the worship gathering. It'll be decent. It'll be in order. It will be edifying. It won't tear others down. There won't be confusion about it, but there'll be peace about that thing. It's a wonderful thing when that happens. I love it. I think it's great. But how dare we try to manipulate that just because we enjoy it? That we cannot do. You can't create a move of the Holy Spirit. But you shouldn't hinder a move of the Holy Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. So what have we learned? Good passage. Good chapters. What are we taking away from this? First, spiritual gift and worship are for the purpose of building up the church. They are not for individual fulfillment. So whatever your views on the gifts, if they're toward the individual ends, the individual means that you've gotten it wrong. Second, disorderly worship does not build up the church or present a good witness to the gospel. Third, our worship must praise and honor God and build up and honor the church and its members. We should refrain from doing things in worship that do not edify the church, even if they edify us personally. Our worship should be orderly. We should desire and pursue spiritual gifts to use in our worship gatherings. Too often we come to the worship gatherings for what we can get out of it. May we instead begin to think ahead toward our worship gatherings that we can give glory to God while we are here and that we can edify others as we gather together. It is wonderful what you can take away from it, but... We can't always just be consumers. If everyone's a consumer, then who's creating? Some of us have to be doing the edifying. And you'll find as you mature in your faith, you'll be more edified in edifying others than you ever were being edified by others. It's kind of like it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it's truly the case. So may we instead come here to glorify God and to edify others. Verse 26, let all things be done for edification. Verse 33, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. Verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order.